Wonderful. Everyone in the chat, I would love it if you have a warm welcome for Amanda. And I'll give the introduction. Thank you so much for being here, Amanda. Um, gosh, I'm excited. Amanda and I had really great chats about the whole pro-life and dignity movement when we were organizing this. And she's absolutely full of um, really great ideas for the years going forward. So the presentation is, if you tell a story, the power of stories in humanizing the culture. Why are the life issues of our day so fraught? How can our conversations about abortion, euthanasia, and reproductive technolog technologies be so polarizing? One reason is because these topics are eminently personal. But rather than being a problem, Amanda thinks that the personal dimension of these issues give us a reason to be hopeful. Through telling stories that are deeply affecting and that strike at the core of what it means to be human, we can humanize the culture and build a culture of life. Amanda will share some stories of her own and give practical examples of how sharing compelling stories, even at the national level, has contributed to elevating the cultural conversation around some of the most contentious and meaningful issues of our time. I love me a practical session and an inspiring session. A bit about Amanda. Amanda Ackman was born and raised in Calgary. In high school, she was a two-time winner of the Knights of Columbus Respect for Life oratorical contest. Raised in a Jewish Catholic family, Amanda has had a lifelong passion for promoting freedom of conscience and religion. She recently completed a master's degree in John Paul II Philosophical Studies at the Catholic University of Lublin in Poland. Amanda has attended more than 100 seminars, conferences, and programs throughout North America, Europe, and the Middle East, East and has extensive experience organizing issue-based advocacy campaigns, event planning, and telling stories through video. She currently works with a conservative MP on issues of human dignity and human rights. Amanda also blogs daily about death, dying, culture, and meaning at dyingtomeetyou.ca. I encourage everyone to visit dyingtomeetyou.ca after today. It's a wonderful blog with beautiful insights. Everyone, I would like to welcome you, Amanda Ackman. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Francis, for the kind introduction and to Saskatchewan Pro-Life for having me and to Kelly Block for being a wonderful and inspiring parliamentarian and to my friend and former colleague, Michael, for helping coordinate this as well. It's a joy to be here with you. Welcome back. We're ready. <laughs> All right, here we go. So. Today I'm going to share a bit about why I became inspired to tell stories in a way that is consistently humanizing and uplifting, something that our culture is certainly starved for. There are three key components that I found to telling a good story and that I think can help you in communicating and telling the stories that you have to share as well. Those three points are vulnerability, values, and vision. First, I'll share a little bit of a personal story, and then I'm going to share some videos that we produced within the context of the parliamentary office in which I work and how these are kind of examples of what I'm hoping to illustrate insofar as how to communicate to the culture in a resonant way as widely and as aspirationally as possible. So we'll have a good Q&A session after. Feel free to jot down ideas as they occur to you throughout the talk. All right, so a bit for my personal story and how I got to where I am today. I'll begin by saying that my earliest memory is not really a memory, it just feels like it is. Because when I was just two years old, I had a younger brother named Brandon who died. He died because he was born extremely prematurely and his kidneys didn't work very well. And he spent most of his life in the hospital. At the funeral, my dad held me and my mom helped me kiss my brother's forehead and gently close his tiny casket. And the reason why this feels like a memory is because we have home video of it. My dad put together a tribute video honoring my brother Brandon's life. And we have videos not only of the funeral and of his baptism, but also of a day in the life at the hospital. So I could see growing up what it was like when he was in the hospital and not at home with us. 
And so my parents tell me that I really loved watching these videos, even the video of the funeral, because I could recognize everyone in it, all the aunts and uncles. And so growing up, I had this sense of connection to, to my younger brother. And my parents were always making space for Brandon's memory within our family life. My mom also loves scrapbooking and journaling. And when she realized that there aren't really journals or there weren't at the time, books specifically for premature babies and the milestones that they have, she created a special care baby book. And she even sold these because of seeing the need to honor the lives of little babies who had milestones different from babies who were uh, developing along the normal trajectory. And so growing up, we had this space for Brandon's memory within our family life. And on his birthday, both into earth and into heaven, my brother Evan and I would both receive a cupcake and we'd take out our special care baby books that we each had to honor our brother Brandon and put together the memories of his life. It was in cherishing Brandon's life that I really had a spark ignite for my pro-life activism because I realized how much meaning and value Brandon's life had. And it wasn't because of what he had done. He only lived seven months, but so much was done by God through him and in our family life that I thought every life has tremendous value. Then growing up when I was in high school, uh, I, my grandfather moved in with us and I called him Zeta, the Yiddish word for grandfather. Well, he was a Polish Jewish atheist who hoped more than anything that I would just abandon my faith when I got to university and that if that didn't work, that studying the Holocaust would do it. So I took the challenge seriously. And when I was 18, I traveled with 60 students and two survivors to Germany and Poland on the March of Remembrance and Hope Holocaust study trip. This was completely pivotal as well. And it's not an exaggeration to say that there is not a day that goes by that I do not recall this trip of all the trips in a particular way. Some people didn't understand why I wanted to go on a Holocaust study trip. And later I also went on a genocide study trip to Rwanda. They didn't understand why a person would want to go and confront so much evil but the survivors were emphatic as we journeyed with them that our listening was in a way healing for them. They were always thanking us and this totally astonished us that these survivors were quite elderly would continually thank us for making space in our minds and in our hearts and in our schedules to listen to their stories. We just found it overwhelming that paying attention to them could help them see even greater meaning to their own survival. So it was during this trip that one of our guides said that dehumanization is at the core of genocide. And I thought, okay, if dehumanization is at the core of genocide, then what does it mean to humanize humanity? What is the antidote? And this is a question that has absorbed me for my entire adult life and been quite decisive in my whole trajectory in terms of studies and professional life. So against the darkness, we need the antidote. That was clear. And it was also clear from the survivors, particularly one survivor named Feige Libman, who insisted that she never speaks about the Holocaust without discussing the righteous among the nations. The righteous among the nations are those who were not Jews, who risked their lives to save Jews. She, at every school presentation and in every time she shares her story, always, always ends with stories of righteous among the nations. So wanting to learn something about what it means to humanize humanity and the culture eventually led me back to Poland for graduate school so that I could become a student of saints and heroes and martyrs. And it was really that testimony of the survivors that I met who affirmed the miracle of human life and the goodness of the world in spite of everything. And that really serves as an endless inspiration to me. So when I got back to Canada from that Holocaust study trip, 
My grandfather resigned himself to the fact that I hadn't totally abandoned my faith, but he was happy that I was home and sharing all about the trip with him. We were really close and he was my intellectual sparring partner for sure. And he's the one who most strongly instilled in me a sense of Jewish identity. We went on dates at an Italian restaurant and I would always get him extra maraschino cherries for his Shirley Temples, which were his favorite drink. And he lived with us from the time that he was 89, just about until he passed away at the age of 96. Seeing how my parents made space for him within our family home and in our day-to-day -day routine was actually one of the very best things that they did in raising me. And I try to write to them uh, annually a letter at their anniversary, specifically noting this and thanking them for it. So those are just a few anecdotes about why I'm pro-life. And I think you can see the relevance that all of this has to the tasks of cultural renewal that really stand before all of us. So when I was a kid, of course, as we all learn, every story needs a beginning, middle and end. That's what I was told. But as I got older, I learned that the most painful subjects are made bearable, not only by telling a story with a beginning, a middle and end, but by telling a story with the narrative structure of reality, telling stories with a passion, death and resurrection. This is what we're looking for. And these three points really correspond to vulnerability, values, and vision. Really, it's just another way of putting it. Vulnerability, values, and vision. So I'll say a little bit about each of these points, and then I'd like to show two videos, and then we can discuss a little bit of behind the scenes, what went into making these videos, and their aspirational positive feel. And then we can, yeah, we can discuss that further. So the first point, vulnerability. Encountering people in their vulnerability and revealing stories through vulnerability creates an openness of spirit. It creates an, that rapport because as a youth minister told me when I was in junior high school, and I still remember it, this really stayed with me, people identify better with you in weakness than in strength because fragility is part of the human condition. Vulnerability does not mean, however, lowering our standards to some lowest common denominator and neglecting ideals. No, it's, it means a willingness to contend with the grittiness and the messiness of life without losing a sense of the dignity to which we are called. There are lots of ways that pro-lifers can lean into the realities of vulnerability and become more resonant, not only with the culture at large, but also with pro-lifers too. I think of topics like infertility, miscarriage, abuse, fatherhood. The more that we are open to the full amplitude of reality, the more that we are going to have to offer. That's just a little bit about vulnerability. Now, when it comes to this issue of values, there is meaning for you to discover that cannot exist without you. Let me explain what I mean. When I work on my daily blog about death and dying, I found through the interviews that I've conducted that people are so surprised at the blog posts that are their stories because they might say, well, I didn't realize I had a story or I didn't know there was anything to that. We need others to draw out stories from us because we make meaning in community, in relationships and through telling the story. Like the survivors of genocide who say, your listening is healing for me. We need to discover meaning through interest and through attention in others by making the space to hear the stories and draw them out. Isaac Dennison, a novelist said that all sorrows can be born if you put them into a story or tell a story about them. All sorrows can be born if you put them into a story 
or tell a story about them. So we need others to draw out meaning in our lives, to make meaning out of the suffering and trials that we contend with. So many people don't think they have a story or in thinking that they find that their suffering is senseless. That's our task. Our task is to make sense of the suffering and to bring out the meaningful values in, in our lives. I have read thousands of pages of John Paul II. I went and studied uh, in Poland for two years and really of all that I read, I'm going to share my very favorite quotation with you. This is from a letter that he wrote to a friend before he left Warsaw. And he said, people's values are different and they come in different configurations. The great achievement is always to see the values that others don't see and to affirm them. The even greater achievement is to bring out of people the values that, will, that would perish without us. In the same way, we bring our values out in ourselves. Just one more time, because there's a lot there. People's values are different and they come in different configurations. The great achievement is always to see the values that others don't see and to affirm them. The even greater achievement is to bring out of people the values that would perish without us. In the same way, we bring out our values in ourselves. What are the values that others don't see? There are many. Our task is to see those values and affirm them. This is how we bring them out. So lastly, I just want to touch briefly on the importance of positive framing before we get to watching these videos, because the challenge is to share our ideals aspirationally. We are in a climate that is very difficult and a political environment where we may be prone to discouragement. But upon reflection, I can't stop thinking about how all of the ideologies that we now discredit were wrong because they had a wrong idea of the human person. And the way that we renew our culture is through revitalizing a, and recovering a correct view of the human person. Well, the nature of the human person is to hear good news to receive good news. That's not to say that we gloss over the difficulties or the drama of life. My whole life definitely involves contending with this, but we are made for goodness and truth. And that's what we need to com communicate more and more and more. Against the chaos and disorder and confusion, we need to consistently and beautifully present a vision of another better life. I had studied the Holocaust in Poland. What brought me back were the words of John Paul II's biographer, George Weigel, who said, the noble life is still the most compelling witness for the fundamental truths that are the basis for our common world. We are starved for saints and heroes and martyrs, for the noble life and for a vision of beauty and truth. It's up to us and we're responsible. So we can never get too discouraged because of all that we have to do. And so with vulnerability, values and vision in mind, I'd like to show you two short films produced by the office of MP Garnet Genis, through which we as a team try to accomplish some of these aims about which I've spoken. So whether you've seen them before or not, I encourage you to watch them with a bit of a more critical eye in light of all of that. My name is Taylor Hyatt. I'm a young professional living in Ottawa. I live in a cozy little apartment downtown with a fat cat. In my spare time, you can catch me checking out new coffee shops. I'm a bit of a foodie. I like to drag my friends on restaurant finding adventures. I have a linguistics degree from Carleton University. What else do you need to know? Growing up as a young girl with a disability, there, there were a lot of expectations on me that I would be independent and be able to manage my own life. 
now I love my life. I love being able to have my own apartment and do many of the same things as the average person. When I was a year and a half old, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Growing up, especially in school, I felt a lot of pressure. That meant that if my body didn't match up with what my classmates could do, I had to compensate somehow. I relied on my mind. I threw myself into academics. All this work of trying to prove myself has actually given me a bit of a complex. I worry about being a good friend, whether I can hold up my end of a relationship, not burden anyone, and be the one who is able to give instead of receiving all the time. It's a pretty normal thing for me to get a cold every year, but two years ago, I got sicker than usual. To add to the problems, my, my wheelchair had broken down and I had no energy. I couldn't walk to the walk-in clinic. And we all know that it's pretty awkward to knock on the door of neighbors you barely know in your apartment. I started texting a bunch of friends, but they were out of town. I had to call a cab and check myself into the hospital. I got to the hospital pretty late at night. Keep in mind I was alone and tired and really sick. They ran a few tests, didn't really know what was wrong. And when the doctor came to see me, she said, whatever this is, it's really affecting your breathing. And if it comes to it, you might need oxygen. Is that something you would want? I thought, well, of course I do. And then a few seconds later, she followed it up with, are you sure? Apparently I qualified for an end to my life right there. I know my situation must have looked awful. I was a disabled woman, alone, tired, and sick. I kept thinking of other people with disabilities who had been denied the supports they needed, and now it was happening to me. But as it turns out, I just had pneumonia. But the hospital visit left me shaken. I was wondering where my value comes from. Am I only valuable when working on Parliament Hill, when studying in school, when out with my friends? What has been your greatest suffering? My, my greatest suffering, contrary to what many people might believe, doesn't come from my disability. It comes from trying to live up to the ideal of independence, of not wanting to need anyone, rely on them, be a burden to them, thinking that I have to do everything on my own, thinking that I should be ashamed for needing help, feeling like my life is not worth living if I need other people. I'm afraid of inconveniencing them. I was the same person at school or at work as I was in the hospital bed that night. It's taken time for me to realize that I'm valuable for who I am, not just what I can do. And when we get that confused, it actually hinders all of us. All right, so there's one example that was from a, a little more than a year ago. And there's a lot in four minutes happening there. And in order to get to that story, it really takes seeing the values that others don't see and drawing them out through conversation. So we spoke with Taylor for a couple hours and she shared a lot more of her story than what you saw there. And there are different ways that people share their story when they think that they are communicating for one purpose or another. So thinking about the audience, whether certain stories are told one-on-one -on -one, and then certain stories come out in the sense of communicating them more broadly. We also were keen to avoid any legislative jargon or words that could be polemic because normal people don't speak in those terms and don't speak in abstract categories about their day-to-day -day situations. And that's why it's so important to practice telling stories in a way that is sincere and natural, because in that naturalness, we get to the heart of the, what we can 
start what we can see as a starting point for common ground and for that openness of spirit that we so much long to see in our conversations. We don't want to include any language that's going to make people immediately check out or immediately uninterested, but we want them to get to know Taylor and to feel like they have met a person and then to become invested in her story and see it through. So that's just a couple remarks about that one. We're now gonna show another one that's a little bit more recent. Uh, you may have seen this one as well. Again, view it with an eye to these points of vulnerability, values, and vision, and see how we were able to make a video about suicide, depression, and mental illness, and, and self-harm into a story that is actually aspirational and filled with ideals, taking some of the darkest, most difficult subjects to contend with, and putting them in a humanizing light for the sake of renewing our culture. My early experience with depression could best be described by saying, the world lost its color. Depression does that. I was 14 years old when it started. I didn't understand what was happening to me and that made it really hard. I began to self-harm and then I struggled with anorexia, then bulimia. I was 15 when I first tried to kill myself, and I attempted suicide seven times in the years that followed. It was on the seventh attempt that I got the closest, and it was then that I realized that in wanting to end my suffering, I might actually do something final. My name is Garafaya Malusis and I'm speaking about my mental health struggles because I'm scared that doctors could soon be able to end the lives of people suffering with mental illness, people like me. To be honest, if medically assisted suicide had been available when I was in university, I might have used it to end my suffering as soon as I could. Some politicians talk about safeguards that exist to protect vulnerable people from accessing medically assisted death. But I have 10 years of experience pretending to be okay, and no, the proposed safeguards will not protect or save me. You know, some people living with mental illness will thank you for making it possible for them to die. But that's the problem. Because in two years, in four years, that same person will not thank you. And that's why I'm here. I'm the future version of myself who survived to tell you this. In moments of crisis, you're not planning for the future. And so when I self-harmed and when I attempted suicide, I wasn't thinking about what it would mean for me to have scars everywhere, right? I wasn't planning on living that long. And so now I have to deal with the consequences that come with that because there's only so long you can wear long sleeves in Canada. I mean, it does get warm eventually. So I'm still here, but it's a struggle and life is like that. There are still highs and lows and the things I've considered and tried do come back to me. That's why this scares me, because had someone been willing to assist my suicide during one of those lows, I know the life I've lived would not have happened. I didn't try to kill myself because I wanted to die. I tried to kill myself as a last ditch effort to end my suffering. If this legislation passes, my mental illness would qualify me for medically assisted death and put me at risk. And when I'm in a headspace like that, I'm already fighting internally. I can't be fighting to keep myself safe on all fronts. I need someone to be my advocate in those times. That's what suicide prevention is for. Death would have been a way out, but with the right interventions and relationships, I was able to find a way forward. So I want to say right now to whoever needs to hear this, death doesn't have to be the answer. It takes work, it takes time, it takes others, and it's complicated, but there is hope. Now I'm excited about my future. I'm preparing to marry my best friend and I can't wait for us to start our lives together. Still, the struggles with mental health remain. I'm sharing my story because I'm not the only one who has more to live for. There are people in your life who do too. As someone who struggles with mental illness, I don't need someone to tell me how to die. 
I need someone to tell me to stay. Another example of storytelling where sincere vulnerability and meaningful values and aspirational ideals come together. When we were working together on this project, we set for ourselves the challenge of creating a video that people would love, like, and share, and not angry or sad react to. That, when we first started, seemed extremely challenging to us. And yet, with Leah's story, we were able to draw out the values, the value of life, the value of resilience, the value of we are not autonomous, expressive individualists. We are persons in community who need the support and the love of others in order to get through uh, the difficulties of life and to contend with the fragility and vulnerability of the human condition, which we all share. And so that video, I, as far as I could see, received no hate, no backlash. It was viewed almost half a million times across various social media platforms within the span of just a few days. And it was shared by more than 40 members of parliament. And so I don't think we muted any of the essential points. I don't think we needed to conceal any of the values that we sought to bring out. What we did need to do is to know that the nature of the person is to be a receiver of good news and that people are starved for a vision of what is good and beautiful and true. And as we all are active in this space, seeking to build a more life-affirming culture, that's what we want to keep in mind because it is our task and we're up to it and we can do it with vulnerability, values, and vision. I welcome your questions. Okay, so we've got a question here from Nicole. Uh, can you contrast how it could have gone badly? How did you get to the spot where you can tell the good, beautiful, and true? Hmm. I think one way that it could have gone badly is if we had used words in which the debate is being had politically, there is certainly a place for legislation and for political discussions. However, most people find political language very polarizing. And as soon as you say one word or another, it puts you on a side and it becomes divisive. And so using, um, using certain words, which we very intentionally avoided, we wanted to show rather than tell. And I think the sign that you can tell that it's going to go well is when you can show your point rather than telling it because then it affects people. You want to create something where the person has a sense, this concerns me. And once it concerns them, it's about them, they can see themselves in it, then it's inviting, then it creates what I've heard spoken of as a hospitality in the imagination. And so it doesn't go well if you don't try to treat your audience as a guest for whom you're trying to evoke a hospitality of imagination. If you do that, if you really try to show hospitality to your viewer, I don't see how you can go wrong. We've got a bunch more comments. Um, I've seen this video before, but it once again captured my attention and gave me understanding of mental health. The video also gives hope and shows the beauty of life, even with our struggles. Puts a face to the issue. How and where, this is from Marriott and Dan, how and where are the best places to tell our stories in a culture when there is such an effort to shut others down and silence them? Hmm. Great question. I think that we can all tell stories all the time. And so with this blog that I've started, about death and dying. It's also an antidote to the work that I do day to day, kind of my personal therapeutic project where I'm looking at uplifting and humanizing stories about death. And basically, I'll admit, I created an excuse to have meaningful conversations with people because I say, oh, I'm working on this blog and I might be sitting 
um, next to, to my roommate over dinner, or I might be on a, on a morning walk with a friend. And from there emerges a story. And uh, obviously I tell the stories discreetly and, and in such a way that uh, people are comfortable with. But we all, in the course of our day-to-day, -day, whether it's conversations over meals, it, it's not complicated. Yes, online people can be more hostile and confrontational, but I think that's often because of the lack of vulnerability. It creates a chasm in the ability to connect because people are always showing the best side of themselves online. We don't see suffering grappled with in public or in the realm of the social on social media. And that's probably appropriate to some extent and yet there, there ought to be ways without completely divulging personal emotional experiences to let on to some of the vulnerability of human affairs. Like with this video of Leah, the other challenge was telling a story about mental health and self-harm and depression that people would feel comfortable sharing, that it wouldn't be weird for them to share, that people wouldn't sort of wonder about them for sharing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was another balance we tried to strike because it it would have gone badly if people thought would be embarrassed to share the video. But in this way, we see that she's triumphant and not just in spite of her vulnerability, but she triumphs in showing her vulnerability. And a few of you have already commented to that. And a lot of the comments were very affirming of her courage. And many of you know that she's also uh, an outspoken pro-life advocate. So um, I think I think that's what I'd say there. After the conference, we'll share these videos for sure on our page. And I encourage everyone to share it with their loved ones, maybe their friends. They're talking about these issues as well as on their social media pages. What are some, here's a question. What are some of the um, political terms to avoid? When you, with debates around euthanasia or abortion, what are some political terms to avoid? I presume in creating this humanizing content. And uh, okay, words to avoid. One thing that comes to mind is there's this excellent book by uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, who died this past fall. It's a book that came out uh, just shortly before he passed away. And the book is called Morality. Uh, restoring the common good in our divided times. And he has a great chapter in there on us, them language and how to combat polarization. It's simple. We really want to avoid framing debates, conversations in polemic language where there's an us and a, a them. Instead, if we speak about we, then people can see themselves included and that becomes more constructive. So even pro-life and pro-choice, it's qu quite dichotomous. And so if people are ambivalent or if people are not particularly formed one way or another, then using language that is inclusive of the community uh, looking toward the common good will be more inviting. It will create that hospitality. Um, using sort of uh, basically a, one thing that we have been trying to do in our videos is to not use the names of legislation because no normal person casually talks about Bill C-7 in their day-to-day. -day. With words like euthanasia, medical aid in dying, maid, all of these words are, are beginning to immediately signal what side of the divide you're on based on the language that you use. So telling stories that don't use political jargon like that can help. Telling the stories as people nat naturally and casually speak to each other about it can, can go a long way to including people and making them see themselves reflected in the stories you're telling. So that they have a sense, this is for me too, this concerns me. How would you, we have a question from Michael Hetrick. Hello, Michael. How would you humanize specifically a pre-born child? Well, I think uh, even just to a story I heard the other day when I was asking someone uh, why she's pro-life, she said, in all my experience, every time an aunt 
uh, was pregnant, I was so excited because I was expecting a cousin. And it was really obvious and intuitive that she was looking forward to this relative. And I am so convinced, and actually John Paul II was so convinced that parent and child find each other by means of the word my, my child. And Aristotle said, there are two things that chiefly inspire affection. One, that something is your own, and two, that it's your only one. So the sense of preciousness and the sense of belonging. And so using words of relation can be so key to humanizing. As soon as you say, oh, your child, rather than the fetus, you see the difference in the language. And these are the parents of the child, your son, your daughter. This is, it's, it's so basic and yet, the relational language is so transformative at, illuminate, at illuminating the reality of relationship. And uh, I wrote a blog post recently about the Terry Schiavo case and uh, Taylor actually had written a wonderful piece about it in which she talked about how the whole Terry Schiavo story transformed her life, inspired her activism, moved her to involvement. And I commented in my post that it's, silly to, it's wrong to ever speak of someone as being in a vegetative state because nobody has ever been inspired to change their whole life's course by a vegetable. Like Terry was a person and being such, she could be related to not only in her life, but even in her legacy and in her death. And in the language of relation, we find each other. Let's make this the final question. Uh, Tracy asks, Amanda, when you spoke of dehumanization is at the core of genocide, where, do you say, um, where did you say they spoke of that? So that was in the context of the Holocaust study trip that our guide, it was probably at Auschwitz or Majdanek, at one of those sites had made that comment. Yeah. Wonderful. See, there's a bunch of those quotes. I'm going to email Amanda uh, her own ones and the ones she shared from JP2, uh, George Weigel. Um, uh, I forgot the the rabbi's name. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the rabbi's name, but um, I'll get a bunch of those quotes. We definitely want to propagate this, this these um, gems of wisdom. Could everyone in the chat give a big vocal chat round of applause for Amanda? Thanks, Thank everyone. you for your time. Um, and we really will be, um, yeah, praying for your, for your ministry and all that you do and that, that these videos can be seen by, by the world and change hearts. Um, don't underestimate the power of that one friend. Maybe you find most of your social media friends are, think along the same lines as you, but don't underestimate the power of one person in seeing something and asking the question of, of what, what is goodness. Um,